you have an app. Everyone should have their app on. It's so all the background information you need about these three wonderful people who have joined us today are on that app, and so I won't have to go through and, and tell you about that. But I will make a comment, though. Uh, these three individuals represent a base of employees that work in our parks, our forests, our wildlife refuges, and more. The DNA that, that they bring to this table personally is represented in their organizations. So if you go back and think of Gifford Pinchot and, and Teddy Roosevelt and, and Stephen Mather, the kind of passion and excitement that those people back more than 100 years ago had is shared in this room. There's DNA that all of us have in common, and it transcends everything from where we were born, whether it was urban or rural, eastern, western, whether we vote R or D, whatever, whether we're, whatever our religion is, that passion about the outdoors is something that's driven uh, here, and I think will be shown. And I guess I'd like to start there. It seems to me that the precepts of an organization like the Forest Service reflect exactly the principles behind the Conservation Corps movement. Things like conservation and service and diversity. How do you see the matchup behind the Organic Act for our national forests and forestry in this country with the kind of, of guidance that the, the Conservation Corps movement brings to the country, Vicki? Wow, thank you, <laughs> Derek. Uh, I'll try to boil it down uh, and not go through 115 years. We, uh, we turned 115 years uh, old uh, last week at, at the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, of course, the Organic Act was, uh, was, was what was the found, founding of the Forest Service, starting with the forest reserves, and it was basically to say this new nation needed a sustainable a supply of water and timber to build and sustain this nation. And there was a series of uh, maxims that our first chief, Gifford Pinchot, one of the founders of conservation in this nation, had at the time. And I'm gonna fast forward 115 years and really anchor to where we're at today. Uh, it's a little more complex. Uh, our, we have a multiple use mission uh, that certainly includes uh, water and forest products, but it includes a, a variety of services and benefits uh, for all of the nation. Our, our uh, not a lot of folks really realize this, our mission is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands. So we're clearly anchored in the 193 million acres of national forest system that we manage, but we work uh, with uh, state forestry organizations and a, a plethora of other organizations, including the Corps, to help sustain uh, the all, all forest lands, all 766 million acres of forest lands in this nation because critical public benefits flow from all forest lands. So we've really, uh, as we turned 110 years old, we've been on about a five-year journey to really contemporize those, those maxims. And we wanted to have no question what we stood for at the Forest Service. That means within our organization of 30,000 plus people and with those that we serve. So we, we did a variety of workshops across the nation and were informed greatly by what we call um, the next 100 years of conservation dialogues we held to really land uh, our, our core agency values because we didn't want any question uh, what the expectations were from the Forest Service. And Derek uh, mentioned uh, 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 several of them, and there's a real link to the core network here, folks. It, it's not rocket science. Our, our first core value is conservation. And the way we contemporize that today is that our stewardship responsibility helps uh, sustain nature to provide for life, all life, human life and all life. Because nature provides, nature matters, we can make it last for the long run if we take care of it together. Uh, so conservation is the heart and soul of our, our, our first agency core value, which 
the work you all do with us is central to getting that work done. Second core value is service. Service to each other, service to the American people. Uh, it's that service ethos and ethic of what draws folks to the Forest Service and what draws us to partners like yourself. Our third agency core value is diversity. Diversity in all things. And that means the welcoming inclusion. We are learned by our ecosystems that the diversity uh, that, that we depend on across the ecosystems and we also believe strongly in the human, uh, the human dynamics and the human communities. Uh, fourth is interdependence. Uh, we need each other and again, informed by our ecosystems, there's many interdependencies, more so today than, other, than any other time. Uh, a, a, an agency of the Forest Service size does not have the resources, the capacity, or the social license and the energy to do all the work that we collectively need to do across this nation. So we are really focused on interdependency and looking outside ourselves to something bigger and greater. And the fifth uh, core value for the agency is safety. That means physical safety, social, and psychological safety for everyone. Everyone should feel respected, included, and have a safe working environment. And you all stand on tall shoulders of what you represent here in the core network. And, and we were able to catch uh, uh, one of your awardees here, which is magnificent. magnificent. So I, I would just say, uh, Derek, I could go on and on, but that's where I see the linkage between the uh, the Forest Service, all the public land uh, agencies, and the core network, and the value we jointly can bring together. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. David, it's fun to have you up here. I mean, I, I've had the, the fun of knowing you for a bunch of years, and you not only have the passion, but you bring the symbol of diversity, and you talk about leading an agency that symbolizes where the CCC has made the mark that we most know about. I mean, as I think about that, I think about, uh, it was just two or three years ago that we were out where you were the superintendent of Grand Teton with Bob Stanton, right. uh, and, and thought about the importance of the role that he symbolized coming from Texas, as you do, right. uh, and becoming eventually the director of the National Park Service Share with us your views in terms of the cultures of the Park Service, your precepts, and how that relates to the current generation of sure. conservation corps. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that opportunity. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here, too. For me, it's personal. In 1976, I was in the Youth Conservation Corps at Anahuac National Wildlife Refuge. In 1977, I was a Youth Conservation Corps enrollee at Caddo National Grasslands. So I got my, both my colleagues here covered. <laughs> Thank the, you. Ir the irony <laughs> is I, I didn't work in a national park as a YCCer, but I knew that I was gonna spend the rest of my life preserving and protecting our nation's most special places and all the stories that they contained. And it was the YCC program that enabled me to begin that journey. So for me, it's personal. I don't need anybody to make the business case with me as to how important what you do is to our nation's public lands and to the National Park Service. It's clear and it's personal. The other thing that I've had a chance to uh, enjoy is the opportunity to sit in Stephen Mather's chair, our founding director, and in Horace Albright's seat as the first deputy director. No pressure <laughs> at all. But to also learn from what they did to build this fledgling bu uh, bureaucracy called the National Park Service and the National Park System, and what it took to get there. Before coming here, I was on a phone call with uh, 300 of my superintendents around the country talking about what does a second century park service look like? Because we're about to engage in 104 years 
of serving and protecting. The vision that we outlined was something that we call NPS Next, a second century of service. It will include every dynamic you can think of. What does a second century campground experience look like? What does the visitor experience look like? I can tell you that we've spent hours with the hospitality industry, hours with service corps, hours with other partners and stakeholders to get a better sense for what you think a second century park service should look like. And we're still engaging, and that won't stop. The other thing, too, that is clear is that a second century park service has to and will reflect the face of America. That's not negotiable. Mickey, I don't want to spend. <laughs> I don't have the time to spend one moment trying to make the business case for why that's important. I'm going to share a quick story with you, real quick. Superintendent Grand Teton National Park, I get a call from my dispatch, David, we have a, a, a bus rollover, multiple casualties, all hands on deck. I have two helicopters in the park and three ambulances. The bus was a bus full of Asian international visitors. Not one spoke English, not even the bus driver. Had 500 employees. Not one of my employees spoke Mandarin. Yeah, I had the same reaction. Fortunately, the spouse of a ranger did, and she literally saved lives. And make the business case, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that important. One of the other experiences that I have, it's good to see my colleague from Montana, was uh, putting together an opportunity for the Montana Conservation Corps to come to Grand Teton National Park. Why is that important? Grand Teton National Park commemorates 10,000 years of human history and footprint. The Native American history will blow your mind. Mountain men, mountain women, surveyors, ranchers, dude ranchers, all reflect that 10,000 year history. We worked out an arrangement with the Montana Conservation Corps to bring young American Indians from the Wind River Reservation, primarily. They walked in the, in the footsteps of their ancestors, building, protecting, restoring. <coughs> My friends, it doesn't get more simple and basic than that. It's to build the next generation a conservation stewards and workforce in the green and gray. I made very clear on that phone call, we're going after the kids. Get ready. <laughs> and you were part of that. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> well, Margaret, you got a plug from the secretary, and you got a plug from David, who said he started out his career with the YCC <laughs> at a refuge. Um, and I also have to say, I did an informal polls, I talked with various conservation courts. Now, of all the federal agencies, which ones do you see the most receptivity? Where do you find the least of the, the red tape? And I'll tell you, I heard the Fish and Wildlife Service more than I heard any of the other agencies. Do you see a role in the, the work of the Fish and Wildlife Service for Conservation Corps? Oh, well, thank you. And, and thank you for so much for uh, inviting the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and, and me here today uh, to have this discussion uh, with all of you. The work that you do uh, across our country, the work that you do uh, for the Fish and Wildlife Service is essential. It's essential for conservation, um, but it's really essential uh, to some of the, the, the themes that we've heard today, uh, the relevancy. Um, and that's something that we're uh, really, really focused on. One of the things um, I'm most proud about uh, when we talk about the Fish and Wildlife Service, I had the good opportunity to be with the service, uh, well, with the Interior, uh, uh, the first go around uh, when Secretary Bernhardt uh, was there as solicitor, and I served with then Director Dale Hall as his counsel. Uh, so it was a great honor to return to the service about 16, 18 months ago. And so um, w one of the things um, that we're most proud about in the service uh, is, is our mission, um, which many of you are familiar with. But if you think about what our mission is, if you think about what our mission statement is, before you get to habitat, before you get to conservation and critters, it starts working with others. And we recognize in the Fish and Wildlife Service, we can't do it alone. Um, uh, we can't do it without partners, and we can't do it without all of you. 
I've also been fortunate this past year to have the opportunity to travel throughout the country, going to all of our regional offices and spending a lot of time on the ground. Uh, but some of the memories um, that really resonate uh, on that journey uh, have been spending time uh, uh, with some of the affiliates here today. I was in uh, New Mexico uh, in an urban refuge, Valdeor, a little refuge uh, there just outside of Albuquerque, um, and had the opportunity to be there on a day where we had three uh, youth corps there uh, with us. Uh, we had a representative um, uh, from the local community in high school. Uh, we had a local uh, Hispanic uh, group uh, who was there as part of the community. Uh, we had some tribal members uh, there as well. Um, and they had one joint message, one joint mission, um, and that was for conservation. And it is so critically important as we think about engaging communities, as we think about moving forward and being relevant, um, by being able to work uh, with your groups, uh, being able to work with our partners uh, that are so central uh, to those communities to understand the importance of what's going on in those communities. And I heard these wonderful stories about the connections. You, you had, again, you were right outside of Albuquerque, right next to the airport. Um, you, you didn't have these uh, vast backyards. You had small little postage stamp uh, backyards. And, and you heard the stories uh, about how important it was to the neighborhoods and the communities. They were building habitat, uh, building habitat for monarchs, uh, building habitat uh, for, for, uh, for, for birds, uh, um, and, and, and what that work did and what that work and that connection to the community. Uh, there was such pride uh, uh, with uh, the young men and women uh, that were there today to tell these stories. Um, um, and it is always uh, a source of pride for me um, to be able to work uh, with those groups um, as we see um, uh, my good friend David talked about um, a, a need uh, in all of our agencies uh, to be relevant, um, to reflect uh, what this country looks like, to reflect um, the priorities, um, and we are committed in the service to doing that as well. Thank you, Margaret. Margaret raised the issue of wildland fires, and I can tell you the chief has thought just a little bit about fires and the impact there, and, and I think everybody knows that a lot of the work of conservation courses is about healthy forests and forest fuel reductions and a variety of other kinds of things. Is there a way that we can do a better job of partnering not only to reduce forest fuels, but also to build awareness in terms of why the problem exists and the long-term strategies and that will, of course, allow us to, to also return the Forest Service to a more balanced program, because I think it's fair to say that the manpower needs of fighting fires has skewed the Forest Service into a firefighting operation, doing a great job there. But the rest of the conservation mission, the recreation mission, has suffered from that. What can we be doing to, to just help the Congress and the public be aware of the, the big needs here? Well, thank you for that big wide opener that I can hopefully um, <laughs> toss a, a, a good uh, softball through. Uh, you're, you're right, we, you, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna date myself. This will be my 40th fire season, folks. I started on a wildland fire crew uh, in, in 1980, and so I've been involved in wildland fire my entire career, but because of my love of conservation and connecting people to their natural resources, that's the space that I, I bring. And uh, wildland fire certainly is not the big, bad, and ugly, but it's become so because it's so uh, out of its regular uh, role on the landscape. And we have a huge call to action across all lands, but Forest Service, uh, uh, we have 63 million acres at uh, high to extremely high risk of catastrophic fire. And you're absolutely right, it's consuming our resources to respond to fire, and we want to get on the right side of that. We're doing several things. Congress acted in a big way, won't get into all, all the mechanics, but we call the fire funding fix that will, uh, it will finally uh, stabilize that, that big free fall we were in where more and more resources going to, to Congress. But we have to do things differently. We've had a big investment in um, hazardous fuels reduction and creating resiliency on the landscape since the na National Fire Plan in 2000. 
there's good work going on in the ground, folks. I don't want to dismiss that. And there's great collaboration being built. But we're not working at the, we have a scale mismatch, right? We, we have a scale mismatch. We're, we're working at the project level when we need to think about big interconnected landscapes where multiple values flow. So uh, Secretary Perdue uh, announced uh, a shared stewardship initiative, and that's an outcome-based investment strategy where we, we, again, have to get outside of ourselves just looking uh, at what the lands we directly man manage and help meet, uh, uh, we, we're thinking roughly at the state scale, uh, let, let the states help identify what their highest priority needs are for all lands and certainly from public lands and very specifically we want to hear what their priorities are uh, that flow off of their public land. So we, are, uh, we have 12 shared stewardship agreements signed with governors uh, across the nation and we have 20 more in the hopper. And, and, and it's about getting real. We can't set one priority here at the Washington DC level. And I'll just give you a couple examples. The Colorado shared stewardship uh, uh, agreement says, our forests create, well, the value that is highest for us in Colorado forests are the water it provides, the wildlife, and the recreation. Those are the outcomes that are important to Colorado. It's not that others aren't, but that's where they are asking us to really uh, uh, put our priorities and to leverage our joint resources. That's different than what Utah and what uh, 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 Arkansas and North Carolina have said. We then match up our efforts accordingly. And where I think that we really have an opportunity with the core network is instead of working at the project level that we scale up to these landscape levels of what we're trying to do together. That you not just have agreements at the forest level that we take more initiative and we need some your help to think through what that looks like where we can create these, uh, we, we have some shared outcomes that have been identified and uh, the question is, what do we need to do to respond to bring in that, that pipeline of, of conservation uh, stewards and, quite frankly, the future uh, uh, workforce that we really need to develop as we're going forward. So that's, I guess that's the big overarching opportunity. I'm really pleased to say we have seen significant progress in my 10 years, which is really 10 years, with the Forest Service, I had 30 years in state uh, natural resources prior to coming to the Forest Service, uh, of where we really have built, a, a equivalent to the collaborative capacity we build on the landscape, I think we've really built foundational workflows. We've learned a lot from each other. My time when I was Deputy Director of Fire and Aviation, we started up the Veterans Green Corps with, with uh, hazardous fuels funds. That has really grown while it's time to take it to the next strategic level in a, in a true shared stewardship at the scale we really need to work at. How I wish we could stop the clock and just spend another hour because believe me, these three have so much to share with us. But as we close, I'd just like to, to invite you to comment on something. The men and women in this room touch 25,000 youth and young veterans every year who are working outdoors in the public lands I'd like you to, to do two things. Number one, tell me whether you think there's room for a whole bunch of those 25,000 to be employees of your three agencies and make a career in natural resource management. And then why the Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Forest Service are especially receptive to the kinds of youth that are out there in the conservation corps of this nation. So David, let's kick off with you. You were, you know, you, in addition to many other roles as superintendent and other roles, you were the associate director for workforce and inclusion and things like that. Uh, would, do you tell youth that you run into that the Park Service is a good place to look to, to serve, to have a career over the next century? I started with my own kids. And my son is following in my footsteps as a chief ranger. In fact, he's with his uh, tactical team right now on the U.S.-Mexican border serving and protecting. Uh, I have six grandkids. 
one of them will wear the green and gray. Uh, <laughs> and so that's, it gets to the first point that I made earlier. For me, it's personal. Uh, yes, you can have the opportunity to work in these amazing agencies at every level of government to serve, preserve, and protect, and to tell the stories of our nation. That's what I talk about. Uh, you want a piece of this? Come on and wear the green and gray. <laughs> you want, you want to, to work in some of our most iconic, historic, cultural, natural places? Come talk to us. Uh, but the jobs and the landscape speak for themselves, Derek. Uh, I don't think we need to oversell this because once they have a sense that of who we are, why we exist, uh, it speaks for itself. And the reason why it does it because of people like you in the room that get them to these places. Well, maybe for the first time they understand what's in the realm of reality because you have given them an opportunity to step foot on these iconic landscapes. Now, once you do that, we own it with you. And uh, so help us to better understand how we can go about making those transitions as I did so many years ago. What was the second point of your question? I think you've answered everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you. Margaret. Sure. Well, I would, I would first say as, as a daughter um, of a veteran um, and as somebody who keeps coming back to public service, um, uh, the, the notion of public service um, is honorable um, and is important. And I know that you all know that. And so any of our bureaus and agencies um, uh, would be honored to have any one of you come and work for us. And I think that that's the point um, that I'd like to touch on is the idea about uh, what you bring um, makes our organization, makes the Fish and Wildlife Service better and stronger. Um, and I would certainly uh, encourage all of you uh, and the folks that you represent uh, to consider um, a, a, a career in service. Um, uh, we are tremendously proud of the work uh, that the men and women, our employees in the Fish and Wildlife Service do. We hear a lot about the strength of our biologists, and I would put them up against anyone. I think they're second to none. Um, but we have so many opportunities in the Fish and Wildlife Service, particularly um, with some of our wage grade employees, um, with our trades employees. Um, and I think that these folks are really the unsung heroes um, of who we are uh, as service. I've had a chance to spend some time, we call them our MAT teams, um, who get out there, and, and some of, uh, some of uh, the folks here uh, work with those teams. They're able to accomplish things with a tiny uh, amount of money. You've heard that uh, uh, most folks in the Fish and Wildlife Service can fix almost anything with a little bit of barbed wire and uh, uh, some duct tape. And it's, and it's true about being able to take limited resources uh, invest and leverage those resources. And it's something that I'm incredibly proud uh, that the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, is able to do. Um, and I would certainly um, encourage all of you uh, um, to continue partnering with the service. Um, and, and we look forward uh, for years of this partnership. And I can tell you one thing that the Secretary said, I'm, I think my first stop when I get back to Interior is to get on Rick May's list. Um, <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, you've heard the Secretary being excited about this. And the, the last point I would leave is the continuing commitment um, of the service. Um, we're putting money uh, uh, where our priorities are. Last year, the President, President Trump announced the highest level uh, of funding for refuges ever in the history of our country. And today, and I was really excited that this happened today, just two hours ago, uh, he announced um, now the highest uh, funding uh, for the refuge system um, uh, in, our, in our country's history. And so we're tremendously proud about having resources that the Secretary talked about to be able to continue partnering and continuing to take care um, um, of, of our conservation uh, mission. So thank you. Thank you, Margaret. And Chief. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I, I guess I'll boil it down to uh, three simple things. Uh, we need uh, vibrant uh, conservation stewards for the future, and I don't see any other way 
uh, better pathway than through the Conservation Corps to really develop uh, that, that ethos. Whether they come to work directly from one of our uh, fine organizations, it's, it's that experience about uh, uh, helping to sustain nature, to sustain all life that we really need. The second is uh, Congress and the public uh, expect us to work differently, to innovate for the contemporary needs, just like uh, uh, Director Avella was, was describing is what is the experience and the needs of the future? What is the workforce of the future? And we have the responsibility, even though at least I'll speak for myself, I might not be here 20 years from now to, to onboard, but we have the responsibility to really build that pipeline of, of, of that future workforce. And uh, third is we just have a lot of work to get done. And we have to leverage in a way we've never leveraged in the past. And whether it's the Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, or the Forest Service. Uh, we're probably a little biased, but we have these incredible missions, and it's a sense of service higher than self. And that calling that uh, we can hopefully build the pipeline, give the opportunity, and say you're welcome and you're valued here uh, is something that we really need your help on. We want to know how we can improve and build that much needed pipeline because we, we are stumbling in having uh, the diversity of workforce needs. Uh, I can't, we can't get dispatchers uh, fast enough. We can't get road engineers fast enough. We can't get GIS people fast enough. Uh, and so we need to create some of that, 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 that pathway to success for conservation for the future. Vicki, Margaret, David, thank you for what thank you, you do and for your messages today. Thank you. Thank you.